So let's go on for the next talk, uh, which is about usage of QML tools by Orindam Jana from Digia. Welcome on stage, Orindam. Welcome, everyone. Is my voice audible at the back? Yeah? OK, cool. Uh, welcome to this session on usage of QML tools. We talk about coding, performance, and debugging. So let's get to the next one. Who am I? My name is Arundam Jana. Uh, you can uh, catch me on IRC. I usually hang out around the Qt and Qt Creator channels uh, with the nickname Ori. I live in Berlin. Um, I work for the Qt Creator team over here. I mostly work on QML tools, uh, for example, debugger, profiler, and inspector. I, in my free time, I also work uh, dabble in iOS a bit, and yeah, and sometimes I play football. And I think Barcelona is the best team, right? Okay, so what's the objective of the session? We have a twofold ob objective. First, uh, I would like to show you an overview of the existing tools that we have, and then hopefully, if you uh, we'd like to get some feedback over the course of time, uh, you can contact us via mailing list email, IRC, choose whatever you want. But yeah, we'd like to see some feedback and some feature requests, uh, because we'd like to know what, how you use the tools and what, uh, what is missing. So how do we uh, divide the session? Uh, we talk about <coughs> coding, debugging, and profiling first. Uh, we talk about some of the tools in this order. And the last 10 minutes, we have the question and answer session. Uh, if you have any questions in between, feel free to ask. But if, it's, if it involves a detailed answer, I would uh, rather want it to be in the question and answer session because we have a lot to cover. <clears throat> so quick poll. How many of you use Qt Creator for Qt Quick application development? That's a fairly good number. Uh, so uh, I think most of the tools probably you already know about it. So I have some demos. I will not exactly show how to use the tools, but I'll rather show uh, some, some use cases uh, where you can probably, maybe you use it already, but yeah, you, you will see as, as I demo them. The reason I, why I asked the previous question is uh, with the QML tools, most of the QML tools are integrated with Qt Creator. We do have some command line tools, uh, but for serious Qt, Qt Quick application development, you really need to consider Qt Creator as your IDE. At least give it a try. So for the demos, I'm going to use Qt Creator 2.6.0. Uh, and I'm going to use Qt Quick 1 and Qt Quick 2. In most cases, uh, there is no difference between uh, with, with respect to the usage of tools, right? If there are deviations, I have marked them with this black asterisk. and I will explain what are the deviations. So let's get on to coding. So the first thing that we discuss is the QML.js editor, which is there in the Qt creator. Why use the editor? Simply because it understands the QML code model. But what does that mean? That means you can code faster. How? You have code navigation. You have auto completion. You have Qt quick toolbars, something like this. So let's say you have an image and you want to change some properties, you just have this small little light bulb that uh, comes up, click on it, and you can modify properties. It has syntax, uh, syntax check, so it pretty much shows when you, while you are typing these red uh, wavy underline or green uh, wavy underlines. Uh, you can refactor code, uh, easy to maintain code. And of course, it has semantic highlighting, so it's easy to read. The next thing that we have for our coding is the Qt Quick Designer. Uh, the Qt Quick Designer is very easy to, it, it helps you to prototype your Qt Quick applications quite easily. And, and the best part is that you do not even need to know QML coding. It's so basically a drag and drop feature. So you have your uh, component library, just drag and drop, it automatically resizes. It pretty much works the same way that the Qt uh, Designer works. <clears throat> Plus on top of that, you have visual feedback. So it's easy to see how your applications, uh, it's easy to see the GUI, right, as, uh, as you develop your applications. Uh, currently, we have uh, support for Qt Quick 1. 
Uh, support for Quake 2 is ongoing, and let's see. Uh, hopefully, it comes out in very soon. So, I will now quickly show you some demos. So I have this small little demo. It uses Qtquake 1.1. Let's see what it does first. So I have, oops. Uh, I have two buttons and a label. Clicking on the buttons shows a particular message. OK, pretty simple example. Uh, one of the things is, uh, while you're developing Qt Quick applications, it's mostly, it mostly happens that you uh, are not very much concerned about having components at the at very beginning, right? You usually develop uh, step by step. So very similar to this, I have this main QML. I just have one QML file. And I have two buttons. And of course, I have written it over here. There are these two rectangles. You see button two and button one. And there's a text label. So, but I need to reuse a button, right? So it's very easy if I simply refactor it. And I say move component into a separate file. So I name it button. So that's it. And I remove some button specific code into here. And I click button, make this button. I do not need this anymore. Keep the button specific code here. And I'm done. So it's it's pretty easy to move do uh, things like refactoring, right? So now you have a button uh, component, and you can reuse it in other um, in your rest of your code. So that, that's one refactoring feature that's pretty good to use. The other thing that I want to show you is the Qt Quick toolbars. Let's say I have an image. And when I put my cursor right next to the image, this light bulb comes up. Let's see what it does. So you have a cute quick toolbar. You can select, from here you can select an image for this uh, element. I do not have any images, so I cannot show you right now. But yeah, I just wanted to show you the cute, cute quick toolbars. One more thing that I find uh, often useful while I'm coding is, I'm not sure if you can see, but there is a locator bar over here, right down there. So let's see. So you have button QML. Let's see some function. So I'm writing just a function. Let's see if I can find foo. OK, that did not. OK, some things. Uh, my favorite example is always uh, uh, same game. Let me find that same game. Some demos, declarative, same game. This is quite a big example. Let's see if we can find out any of the functions. something like this. So it's, it's, it pretty much lists you all the functions in the example. So yeah, so code navigation is pretty easy using, using the ID. So we're back to our example. Uh, 
you basically have to put an M in front uh, for methods to find out functions. That's the only thing. Let's go back to our presentation. So these are the two things we have from the coding perspective. Any questions? OK, let's get on to the next one, debugging. Uh, I'll first give you an overview of how the debugging works. Uh, you have uh, the, your Qt Quick application running, and you have the developer machine. So uh, the, we have a client server architecture over here. We do it over TCP IP. Uh, when you start your application, we, uh, under debug mode, we have a TCP server that started, and it listens to a specific port that you specify while you start the application. From the developer machine, you connect a client to that uh, port. The server advertises uh, all its services. There are lots of services. Uh, for example, inspector service, profiler service, um, JavaScript debugging service, etc. And the client connects to these respective services. We, of course, have one client per service, so and all the clients share the same port. Uh, caveat. Uh, it's an open port, it's so uh, with TCP IP, so be careful that you have a firewall installed. So what are the steps? First, enable the TCP server, specify the port, and attach a client. Attach, for example, over here, we attach a profiling client, but then you can attach a debugging client or any of the clients. Uh, what should you do to enable the TCP server? You have to compile with QMake argument, config plus equals to declarative underscore debug for Qt Week 1, and QML underscore debug for Qt Week 2. The difference, uh, the reason that we have a different naming is because the, uh, in Qt Week 2, if you use, if you have to include Qt Week 2, you normally do Qt plus equals to QML, right? But in Qt Week 1, you do Qt plus equals to declarative. So that's the reason. You specify the port by passing minus QML JS debugger equals to port, specify the port number. And we have some uh, optional arguments where you can specify the host. Normally, if you're running it on your desktop, it's, it's a local host. And the other one is block. Block is an optional argument which basically blocks the GUI thread of your Qt Quick application till a client is attached to the server. So if you want to start debugging at the very start, probably you send the block argument, and then the application does not launch till you have a client uh, attached to the server. And finally, you attach a client. So, well, if it's, that sounds too complicated, in Creator, just press the debug button. It does everything, so you don't need to worry. OK, so scenario two. You have an application that's running. And now you want to connect and start debugging, right? And you had it running from before, and you do not want, because since you already would have gone through some states, you do not want to restart it. So the question is, what do you do? You attach to it. How do you do it? Uh, you debug, you have start debugging, you mention the port over here, and it attaches automatically to that uh, application, and you can start debugging. However, uh, if you, Remember that you should need to pass these arguments uh, for it to have debugging enabled. So if you do not want to debug from the start, just start your application with those parameters. Do whatever you want at, at the point that you start, want to start debugging. Just attach to it. The second thing that I want to show you is the inspector. So while debugging, you can easily inspect the QML object tree. It comes up something like this. So you basically have a tree. You keep expanding it. You see the parent-child relationship over here. Uh, you can also modify properties and watch them. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much uh, very simple to how locals and expressions work. You see it in the locals and expressions window uh, when you are not on a debug break. With the inspector also comes some tools. Uh, in the debugger toolbar, you have these tools right at the end, towards the end. So there are these three buttons. Let's see what are these. The first one I find is very useful, especially when I'm debugging on the desktop. It's called application on top. Well, the name is a giveaway. So if you click on it, your application 
stays on top while you debug and create, create other, right? So it's very easy to interact. Let's say you have some button interaction, interact and then go to the debug statement. The second one is select. So it's, if, if with this, you basically can select elements in your uh, example or in your uh, application and automatically the QML object tree is highlighted. So for example, you have a button somewhere and you do not know what, what properties it has or what, what is its name, you just click on it and you, in, in your inspector, you automatically see it highlighted. So it's pretty useful to traverse to different elements. It, it also supports double click. If you double click, then it cycles through. So if you have a stack of elements, then it cycles through the whole stack. And zoom is, of course, uh, you can zoom, zoom in, zoom out. Uh, on particular elements. Uh, for Qt Quick 2, uh, we have, uh, we thought that these two tools did not, separate tools did not make much sense, so we have combined them. So you, with the, you can do, you can select an element with the select tool and you can use mouse zoom, for example, uh, to zoom in and out, mouse wheel to zoom, zoom in and out. On the device, you can probably pinch zoom in and out. So we have merged those two. Uh, we now we talking about console APIs. This is one of the first one of the things that you can use if you do not use Creator and you use only command line debugging. We support a subset of the Firebug console APIs. For logging, we have console log, debug, warn, etc. For profiling, we have console log time, console log time end, and of course console log assert, console log trace, which gives you a stack trace at that point, etc. Uh, with Qt Creator, we have an interactive console, so you pretty much uh, get all your debug messages over here, you get your warnings over here, you have filters that uh, you can filter out specific messages, you have search functionality, you can evaluate JavaScript expressions, you have a context under which uh, the expressions are evaluated, yeah, it's, and it is one, a part of the debugger window, so it comes, it's, it's, it's little hidden, so uh, probably by default you see the breakpoints tab and it's right next to it. Uh, in the next version, we are planning to move it to the application output pane so it's much more easier to see and you can and easy to use. Yes? Uh, how do you use the console uh, without the creator? The, uh, you have to, uh, I meant that the console APIs can be used without creator because uh, the console APIs are, they log onto the application output, right? So you do not need the console over there. Oh, okay, okay. But the co interactive console is in Qt Creator. Any more questions? Just a quick review of what the debugging does, debugger does. You can modify register values, you can modify property values of QML objects, you can watch expressions, you can evaluate JavaScript expressions, you can break on JavaScript exceptions, and you can use the select zoom functionality. So time for a quick demo. So first, let's see what this example does. I have two buttons. I have an Im image. Get image gets an image. Basically, I'm cycling through some three or four images and I randomly get, get an image. And that's a clear button. Let's go through the code. It's pretty simple. I have an image viewer, two buttons, and the function fetch image. I have a C++ backend which basically returns me one of the uh, images from the database randomly. So let us debug. First thing, uh, as I said, application on top. It's quite useful. I press that button and it stays on top. Now I can just shift it a bit so that we can interact. This is the QML object tree. You can see all its properties. It 
So let's see the fetch point. So let's try to change this text. So there you have it. It evaluates instantaneously. So you can modify properties over here. Let us see the select tool. So by selecting this, you automatically, in the inspector, it shows you which element has been selected. And zoom. So you can zoom in and out in your application. So let's put a breakpoint. So I have a breakpoint over here in the fetch image. We need to come out of the selection tool. We hit the breakpoint over here. We can modify local variables to that. zoom out a bit. So that changed the, so there you have debugging. Now, we also support mixed debugging in the sense that you have to, if we have a C++ backend, we can also put breakpoints in the C++ backend and debug that. Let's see how we do that. Database.image source basically calls this function. So putting a breakpoint over here. Need to go out of this zoom tool. So there you have it. We hit the C++ backend. We can go through the stack. And then when you continue, you hit the QML breakpoint. Yes. After you set the breakpoint, it will be No. Any more questions? Yes? Uh, yes, please. Uh, can you also uh, in, uh, use a, a C++ backend which was compiled with uh, Visual Studio? As long as the debug symbols are there, yes. Uh -huh. oh, cool. Um, if I have a, <clears throat> a breakpoint in a C++ code, can I see from a call stack where it was called in the QML? That is, uh, we now talking about boundaries, right? So you need to... That is not possible right right now. Yes, we would like to have that feature, but uh, you see, it's there is a boundary between languages and and the way that. So probably if you hit a breakpoint and if you try to look back, you probably see somewhere in JavaScript engine which is called, and yes, it is a thing that we are investigating. Any more questions? Okay, let's get to profiling. The profiler reuses the debugging client server architecture. Nothing new over there. I already explained to you how it works. We have a TCP server that's started. A TCP client attaches to it. The TCP server advertises its services, and the profiling clients attach to each of each respective service. The same steps: enable TCP server, similar thing, pass config plus equals to declarative underscore debug or QML underscore debug. Specify port by passing QMLJS debugger equals to port with the port number. And you have those optional arguments and attach a client. Again, it's simple to use from Qt Creator. Just press the QML profiler start button and it starts profiling. Uh, we have uh, in the QML profiler can be found in the analyze mode. And we have those small little buttons over there, start and stop. And there is this red button that, that's called toggle recording, which basically, if, if you press it, then, then it records uh, events. 
otherwise it does not. So you would not get results. So make sure that it's it's pressed. Uh, similar to what we have on the debugging thing, if you have a prof uh, application uh, and if you want to profile at certain point of time, you can attach to a uh, running application. You need to go to Analyze, QML Profiler, enter the host and port, and you can attach to a running application. Again, like previously, you need to have your application with config plus equals to declarative underscore debug or QML underscore debug, all the you basically have to have it have QML debugging enabled, and you can profile it. Okay, now comes to a standalone profiler. In Qt5, we have a standalone profiler. So for people who, uh, who want to do it from command line, it's pretty useful. Uh, you find you basically some some example how to use it. We have two ways to use it. You can either start the application with QML profiler, or you can attached to a running application. Uh, we have options like from start to record uh, as soon as the application is started. You mentioned the port number if you want to. By default, it uses uh, 3768 or something, a port number. So you, it's, it's an optional argument. And the commands are, are to, rec to toggle recording. It saves the data. The profiling data is saved in an XML format. And if you, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to read. Uh, however, if you want a graphical view of your data, uh, you probably might use Qt Creator because you can load QML, you can load this QML file, and you can then inspect uh, what, what the profiling data. So profiling, salient features. You can see an overview of events in a timeline. You can zoom in, or in and out of the timeline view so that you can see, you can specify in a particular period or see a particular event. You can step through events chronologically or in reverse chronological order. You see a detailed views in a tabular form. You can filter events within a time period. And you, this, I find this one uh, quite useful. You can view callies and callers of functions. So you can see who called whom and who calls whom. Right. We also have profiling JavaScript code, but that's available in Qt5. We profile V8. We, so you also see the V8 profiling results along with, it, along with QML profiling. Um, I'm going to show you two particular use cases of the profiler. Of course, you get a lot of information but, uh, about your application, but I want to uh, specifically focus on two things. You can use it to debug code, surprisingly. Let's see how. So let's see what the application does first. It's a very simple application. We have a red Rectangle on the left and a label on the right which says box on left. I click the button, it animates and say it goes to the right and then the label changes box on the right. Let us profile this application. I go to analyze mode. Profile, start. I click the animate button and again and let's stop profiling. So we get some data. As you can see, I can zoom in and out. Here are some events. And I can check on the events. I can step through events. And as you see uh, in the editor, the code jumps to those particular to the particular code for those events, right? So it's easy for you to navigate through it. So we have this is the timeline view where you see all the events on the timeline. This is the tab in the events in the tabular form. It's a more detailed view. Below here you see the callers and callies of functions. So Create called, create was called from the program, and it called all these bindings, for example. 
and you can step through the callers and callees. You also see total time taken, number of times it has been called, and the meantime, some profile statistics. What is interesting over here is that you have something in in a different color, it's something orangish, yellowish. This indicates that you have a binding loop. What is a binding loop? Anyone knows what's a binding loop? Okay, let's see what's a binding loop. If you see this this program, this or this line has been called by itself here, caller, and it calls itself again. So basically, you have an infinite loop which calls itself and itself again. So, and it's pretty easy to see in, on the timeline too. You have this orangish. things that basically indicate a binding loop. Let's see where the binding loop is. So if we click on that, I have here in the code. So let's see, apparently this creates a binding loop. Let's see what it, why it creates a binding loop. So what it does is it basically says what's the alignment of the text, whether it should be on the left or on the right, depending on the position of the box. How I do it, I have a property called align which I set it by default as left. And then depending on the position of the box, I change this property. However, horizontal alignment is evaluated each time that X is changed. And you return align property. So let's see what happens. X changes, horizontal alignment is evaluated. It returns align. Align is horizontal alignment itself. So it calls back itself again. So that's that's why a loop is created. Which it's 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 pretty difficult to understand from there. Uh, you have something over here, for example, binding loop detected for property horizontal alignment. It's it's a little unclear what it means. So how do we remove it? We do not use this property align. Instead, We just set set the horizontal alignment only when we reach a certain value. So let's see whether this actually removes the binding loop. So we are profiling the application now. I stop profiling. Let's see if there are those orangish lines, not anymore. So, well, we remove the binding loop. So that's one way that you can improve your code, find out binding loops. Uh, seeing this code, uh, we see that these two kind of look suspicious, right? They're like called 127 times. I mean, it's a very simple example. Box goes to the left and to the right. And uh, it's kind of difficult to understand why it's called 127 times. So let's see the profiling data again. What you see above are paint events, and what you see over here are binding evaluations. You see that for every almost every paint event, there is a binding evaluation that's done, which does not seem correct, right? The I set the text, or rather, I want the text to be visible only at the end. In between, the text should disappear. So when the box is at the left, then the text should appear. So that's one evaluation. And when the box is at the other end, the text should appear. So that's another evaluation. So something something's fishy over here. We have too many calls over here. And over here, in this example, of course, it, it's not much of a performance hit. But if this particular function would have done some heavy uh, stuff, then you would have suffered a performance hit. So. Let's see what we can do. This is called binding on. So we have a transition, and we are animating property x for a duration 1,000. So as you change property x, the horizontal alignment is called every time, and which is why you have this binding evaluation done every time that the paint painting occurs. So we need to somehow remove that. 
we remove this very simplistic transition and do a little more in this transition. So over here, what we have is a sequential animation. We say the optimized label. So there, let's see what's an optimized label. So this is a non-optimized label where we set the horizontal alignment and the text. And what does the optimized label do? Nothing, it just has label, that's it. We do, we set the other stuff in transition. So what do we do over here? First, we make it invisible, setting visible equals to false. We do the property animation, and then we have another script animation where we first set the label, depending on where the box is, if the box is on the left or on the right, and then we make it visible again. So now let's see whether this improves our code. I'm profiling it again. So stop profiling. Let's see whether we have improved or not. So as you can see, we have painting events and this one binding event. Let's see in the events thing, which is much more clearer. So we have calls which are, which look pretty much sane, right? They're all in single digits. We do not have three digit numbers anymore. So this is one way that you can improve your code. You can find out whether you are, uh, whether bindings are being called for every animation or transition or state change. You can find out loop bindings. It's 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 I've, I found it quite useful to find out to improve my code. This is it, the way that we do this transition is is not quite trivial, right? I mean, normally you'd assume let's do a property animation. It's pretty easy to use QML, but there are quite a few pitfalls. The profiler is a good tool to to find out your code and improve your code. Let's get back to the presentation. A short recap of what we talked about. We talked about QML.js editor. We talked about the quick designer. Maybe I should show you the designer too. So this is a simple rectangle. Go to design mode. So you have it's, it, it works similar to how Qt Designer works. Let's say I have a rectangle. Put a rectangle over here. You can see the anchor lines, middle and middle of the rectangle, something like that. Like that. Let's change the color, red. Let's put a text label put over here. Let's align it somehow. Yeah. Some text. And let's make it, let's increase the font size. And there you have the code. It's, 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 it's quite useful for quick prototyping. You also have, yes? I'll repeat the question. The question is, uh, if the Qt Quick Designer is practical for larger projects. The Qt Quick Designer right now, if you see, has a limited component set. So you may have to rewrite a lot of components. So there is a little bit of coding involved. However, if you have components and we, if you can integrate that to Designer, then the answer to your question is yes, you can use it for larger projects. But this is basically a UI tool, right? And it does not have any, you do not generate any engine logic. So no background logic. 
So this is just a visual tool. So partly, the answer to your question is partly yes, you can, maybe in snippets, and then integrate it together. But only relying on this on Qt Quick Designer, I would not recommend it. Uh, it's. I think most most people who develop large applications have their own component set, anyways. So it's yeah. If you have a component library, then it should not be too much of a problem. Yeah. One question over here. Okay. Um, a comment. A comment on that on the question. I found out that the problem with the designer is that you uh, if you put um, an item in there, it has absolute coordinates. And absolute width and height, which makes it very, makes it very problematic, if you change the size of the whole window. You can and also anchor elements. So yeah, mm -hmm. and and also, I mean, yeah, I think for quick design it's okay, but especially if you want to connect it with C++ code, it's not that usual. So I I use it mainly for checking whether something is went wrong in my code. Okay, okay. that's a good feedback. Thank you. Yeah, would be the same direction. Um, in practice, um, you see there that it's centered somehow. But in practice, you would say one third of the width. It's the same issue with, with the absolute coordinates. And in, in bigger applications, for sure, there is no absolute coordinates given, because then you end up with, with a very static uh, layout. And there is no way. Or I didn't figure out <laughs> how to use a relative layout there. So say one third of the uh, of the heights, and that's really limiting using, especially for me. Um, Which is why I mentioned that it's yeah. good for quick yeah. prototyping. It's the problem is when it comes for larger applications, and you need very specific UI layouts. And uh, if you had I've already attended Jens, Jens' talk yesterday, we do not have a proper layout manager yet. So this in Qt Quick, it's kind of little difficult to do that. So yes, it involves a little bit of manual work till we have a layout manager that does it. If you um, uh, set the the um, uh, relative properties in in the source code and go back to the designer, will it destroy that? Uh, no. No. Okay. So, so basically, it's it just it's uh, it just creates code. So it just shows what is there on the QML file, and then so you can probably set your elements, and then you can go to your source code and change it. It works fine. Maybe last comment on my side from the designer. The problem is also that this main window, I found out, is too small. Because especially if you work with uh, larger resolutions like um, HD or something, you can never f you can never put the whole picture readable in there. So it would be nice to have to put to make this main window as a separate window to put it on a second monitor or something. So as a recommendation. Uh, yes, that's a good 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 thing because even I found out the same problem because it's too small. There are too many tool tools. Uh, hanging around the sides. Right now, we do not have a way for Qt uh, in Qt Creator that these windows are uh, main top-level windows, for example. So we need to show somewhere where it's a, we detach it from Qt Creator. This, this is basically, I think, it's a doc widget or something. It's, it's a doc widget, so, so then, yeah, it's it's a little... Tricky and yeah, I think. But it's it's a good point, right? Uh, you want your you want the tools to be smaller. So it's it's more like Photoshop, where you have the whole. You can work on your whole application. True. Any more questions? There's a question at the back.
Uh, is, uh, is the designer also existing for Visual Studio add-ins? No. Okay. Is it planned? Uh, I do not. I'm not aware of any plans. Okay. And uh, another question regarding measurements with Profiler. Is there uh, the examples you, you have showed is uh, with Qt Quick 2, right? No, Qt Quick 1. Okay, so with Qt Quick 2, we cannot see any paint events anymore. Or can, we cannot see how many times is needed to paint this. Uh, in Qt, Qt Quick 2, instead of the paint events, you see, uh, you see animation events over there. So let's see in the timeline. Here, instead of painting, you, these are animation events that you see. So you do see, see data. Is there any possibility to measure the time which is needed to draw the screen? Which is uh, under process. Yes, we are doing, we are, it's difficult to find out exactly what time, but we are kind of trying to find out how much time does it take, for example, to load a PIX map. So something like that would be useful, I think. And uh, we are working on that. So it's, it's, it's still, we are still adding features to it. We have a JavaScript tab over here, just to show you what it, so you have some sort of a data. Uh, not much uh, for a Qt Quick 1 application, but uh, it's quite detailed when you have a Qt Quick 2 application running because we get the V8 profiler data over here. I'll get back to the slide, basically the summary. Uh, so we talked about the editor, we talked about the designer. and debugging, we talked about the debugger. You can debug both C++ code and QML code. We talked about the inspector where you can inspect or traverse to the QML object tree. We have a console, you can evaluate expressions. And you have the profiler in Qt Creator. And you also have a command line profiler, which you get in Qt 5. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. You can see uh, for documentation, please go to Qt Creator Manual. I have the link over here. And you can contact me in the Qt mailing list, or that's my email ID, or on IRC. Thank Any you, Arindam. OK. Any more questions? Yeah, regarding the point that came up before that the main window is too small and that you could detach it and then own widget. I think that would also be great for using and the whole Qt creator so then you could use it for multiple monitors as well. Because we, that's right, not, right now pretty not possible at all. <laughs> we had this discussion a little while ago in office and we are thinking of having multiple monitor support. So cool. we, it's, it's, but it's, it's, it takes some time, right? So we need to find out what works and what doesn't. So yes, okay. thank you for your feedback. Uh, for people who want to delve a little bit into uh, debugging and profiling, I have some troubleshooting slides. In case uh, you're wondering why debug doesn't work, then maybe you may have, what I'm showing are all default settings. So maybe if you have changed any of these default settings, then uh, probably debugging doesn't work and you need to find out why. So in projects mode, in build and run, under build settings, you have this tiny thing called enable QML debugging. It's enabled by default. So in case debugging does not work, check whether this checkbox is ticked or not. Similarly, if debugging does not work, check in run settings. So you have build settings and run settings. In run settings, check whether uh, you have de uh, QML debugging enabled by the over here. And if you have problems seeing the inspector tree or object tree, we have that in debugger options. Uh, there is a checkbox that says show QML object tree. That by default it's checked. So in case you have problems and you're wondering, probably this you just check go through these. That's all from me. Questions? More questions? Um, yeah, I hope to hear something uh, from the tools, and I'm missing the translation tool. 
Uh, I did not cover the translation tool because I did not have much. Uh, I don't have slides on it. Maybe uh, after the event, after the talk, we yeah. can talk about it. Any, Any more, more questions? Um, I was just wondering, are there any plans to uh, facilitate uh, enabling QML debugging when you're using CMake as your build system or, or not? Good question. I was expecting this one. With CMake, uh, what you have to do is, instead of config plus equals to declarative underscore debug, you pass the, you d basically set this define QT underscore declarative underscore debug in cap, all in capital letters. If you set that, debugging is enabled. For Qt Quick 1, for Qt Quick 2, it is Qt underscore QML underscore debug. Again, all in caps. So set that, and you are good to go. Um, <clears throat> I just want to ask you, what does it mean that we cannot see uh, frame times in uh, Qt Quick 2? Does it mean that uh, rendering engine doesn't expose this time or? We have the OpenGL which does it, so uh, I'm and we aim, always aim for 60 FPS. I'm not really sure how it works, but I, I do not think we get that data. So basically what we do is we give the data to a renderer thread and then it renders. And uh, we do not have hooks yet on to see how that performs. For example, if you have a hardware, if you have, an, uh, if you have a proper OpenGL support, probably it works fine. But if you have a software uh, rendering done, then uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that we have not yet uh, dealt with simply because we do not know how to deal with it. Okay, so we expect that uh, GPU unit is uh, capable enough. Yes. Thank it's, you. It's, a, it's an assumption, but it's difficult to know. If we have a specific target device, then we can put in hooks. But for a generic, generic profiling, it's kind of difficult to understand how to do it. Any more questions? No questions anymore? Last chance? <laughs> OK, then th thank you, everybody, for thank attending the talk. And thanks again to Arundam.